What a joy it is to see this goodly number out this Lord's Day morning, worshiping together. If you have your Bible, if you'll be turning to the Gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter, that's where we'll begin in just a moment. If you're visiting with this church family, we're delighted to have you in our study. We, in a few moments, will be standing and singing the song that's been suggested. And if you've never put on Christ in baptism, all things have been made ready where you can confess Jesus as the Son of God and be immersed into Christ for the remission of sins. Or if you need to be restored, as we stand and sing, we pray you'd make your way to the front so that your life could be made right with God. It's good to be back, or at least I thought it was. I got heckled by Doug Haywood and Wayne Davis. I thought, you know, poor old fellow sitting up there, and they said, it's good to have Mike back. And Doug's going, yeah. And, you know, just, just good to be home, you know, just kicked around again. So, <laughs> But I appreciate them. In the book of Luke, in the 15th chapter, if you will, notice one verse for the thought of our study. When you come to the Gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter, look at verse 10, and then look at verse 20. Look at verse 10 first. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now drop down to verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I don't know how many times I've preached from the Gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter, but I'm never ashamed to go back and preach on it again. It seemed like every time I read this parable, there's something that just jumps out, and it is a parable that I think we can all relate to when we think about coming back to God. I believe one could study this daily and still not touch the hem of the garment to all the lessons involved. But in our study this morning, I want us to think about some things that Jesus talks about the prodigal son and then make application and the lesson will be yours. In your Bible, in the book of Luke in the 15th chapter, we're familiar with the young man who came to his father and asked his father for his inheritance. I want us to understand that in that culture, in that day, that would be a great insult as it would be in our day. What the young man is saying is, Father, I can't wait till you die. I want what is mine now, and I want to take it and spend it. So here was a young man who, instead of waiting for his inheritance, demands it early. And notice the father gives him that inheritance, and the young man goes into a far country. And notice when he's in the far country, he lives in the very filth of sin. I give him this much credit. At least he didn't stay in the village to live it up. He went to the far country, but perhaps he went there because he knew he could find everything he wanted to indulge in sin. But you remember in Luke 15 that the young man ran out of money and the Bible says a famine came. It's interesting to note that many times something comes at a time when we least expect it and it can touch our lives. In Luke 15, you'll remember this young man is without money. His friends have abandoned him, and he has nothing to have substance. So what does he do? He attaches himself to an individual in that far country, a Gentile who has swine. And that Gentile put him out in the field to feed the swine. And the Bible says he became so hungry, he desired to fill his stomach with the food that the swine ate. I don't know if you've ever slopped a hog or not, but I've seen it done. And I want to tell you, if you're hungry for that, you're hungry indeed. And here he was just wanting what the pigs had. Then all of a sudden, he came to himself, the Bible says. All of a sudden, he realized he's not living for the purpose he was made for. And all of a sudden, his father's house, with all its rules and regulations that he thought he couldn't stand, didn't seem so bad. All of a sudden, he said, you know what I need to do? I need to arrive. I need to go to my father and ask him just to let me be a servant on the land. Notice the young man's humility. He thinks if I could just be a hired hand. He said, my father's hired hands have food enough to spare. I perish with hunger. Maybe my father will just allow me to work on the land. So that young man gets up and he starts to head home. And I've often wondered in my mind, when he walked home, what was on his mind? Did he walk slowly and feared that his father might reject him and not receive him back? But notice one thing the Bible says in Luke 15 and verse 20. One of the most touching scenes is when the father saw him afar off. Many times we talk about the father looking for him. 
But one thing I appreciate is the father saw him, and then, notice the Bible says, the father runs to greet him. You ever thought about how that would have been humiliating for the father? Here you are in a village, and the people in that culture knew exactly what was happening. Men did not run. It was not dignified. You had to hike up your robe to run. And notice the father is going to bear the shame so the son doesn't have to bear it. He runs to the son. And notice in Luke 15, 20, the father, as he is running, is taking up his arms to embrace his son because he had compassion. I like that statement. He didn't say, there's the son who spent my money. He didn't say, there's the son who humiliated me. There's the son who did not show me love or respect. But the Bible said he had compassion. But then if you take your Bible, notice something else. When the father ran to him, he saw the mire of the pig pit. He knew where the son was coming from. He saw the rags. He possibly smelled the swine, and yet he still embraced it. Think about it. The son would have been unclean. But that didn't stop the father. The father runs and grabs him. According to Jewish law, that father might have become unclean too. The son had been with the swine, which to the Jews was unclean. But what does the father do? The father, out of breath, but not out of love, embraces the son. And he says, now, here is my son. The son may who have been scared to embrace his father doesn't have to initiate it. The father initiates it, grabs him, embraces him, and kisses him. Now that word in the original can mean kiss earnestly, eagerly, or repeatedly. Over and over. And what I'd like to do is for just a few moments of our time is think about that father kissing his son and what each kiss could represent. I want you to first think about when the father kissed the son, what do you see? Do you not see the kiss of much love? Though he had sinned, the father still loved the son. And though the son had taken advantage of the father, many may have wondered, did the father still love him? The son may have said, will my father receive me? And yet, all of a sudden, when the father runs, all doubt is removed when he embraced him and kissed him. The first kiss I see is the kiss of much love. Secondly, when that father kissed the second time, I see the kiss of much forgiveness. The son had many sins to confess, but before he ever got to the details of all his sin, the father forgives him. Now notice, the son said, I've sinned. The father wanted to hear that. He wanted to know the son was coming back. But the father did not say, these wounds are going to take a long time to heal. He didn't treat him like an unworthy, untrusting person. He kissed him and forgave him. Now how many parents would have been embarrassed by their son's deeds, his rags, his filth, and said, you know, you're getting exactly what you deserve. But this father was overjoyed. His son had come home. So I see not only the kiss of much love, I see the kiss of much forgiveness. But then I thought about a third thing. In my mind, when I think of that father embracing that son and kissing that son, I thought about a kiss of much reconciliation and restoration. Because the son just says, make me a servant. But the father shows, no, you're still my son. He tells the servant, get the ring. That's the family signet ring. And put it on his hand. Get shoes. Sons wore shoes. Slaves went barefoot. He said, get the robe. And he didn't say, that's the robe, the best robe. Who had the best robe? Probably the father. And you put it on him. He restores him into relationship. What a kiss to be restored and to be reconciled, to be brought back into a right relationship. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And the father embraces him and says, Son, we're going to work on that. But notice what else he had. He had the kiss of much joy. Notice what the father says in the book of Luke in the 15th chapter. It's so touchy. When he talks about the son, he said, my son which was lost is found. My son which is dead is alive. Lost, didn't know where he was. 
Lost because he was separated from the Father. Dead. He didn't know if he was alive or dead physically. Spiritually dead out in the sin of the world. And what does the Father say? Now you are alive. My son was dead, is alive again. He's lost in verse 24 and found. And notice, they begin to be merry. Here the son said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he said, you're still my son. And they begin to be merry. There's joy. Like we read in verse 10, there's joy when one is reconciled. Well, that brings up something else in our study. There was the kiss of comfort. This young man was tired. This young man was hungry and weak and guilt-ridden. And the father's kiss dealt with the past. He forgave him. It deals with the present. I'm not ashamed of you. And it deals with the future. What if I go astray again? The father kisses him again and says, we'll face the future together. Do you see the kisses of the father? But that brings up another thought. There's the kiss of assurance. The father kissed him until he knew he was forgiven and had a chance to start over again. I want to take that. I want to make application in the lesson years. You know, one thing I think we can understand this morning is the love of a father. Now, you know, sometimes our earthly fathers may not show us the love they need to, and many people have not been blessed with a good earthly father. But I want to tell you, if you have been, be thankful for that. But if you didn't have a good earthly father, remember one thing. Don't confuse him with your heavenly father. Because God loves us and God cares for us. And one thing I always need to remember is God is there to receive me. Secondly, have you ever looked at the father's forgiveness and compared it to the older brother? And I want to know which one are we more like? If someone comes and who has sinned against us, are we going to be willing to forgive him? Or are we going to be like the older brother and try to find something to hold a grudge with? I want to tell you, life's too short to be bitter. And life's too short to hold grudges. How many times have I seen people miserable because they've held some grudge? Now, many times in my life I've struggled with that. Many times I had to keep praying and sometimes I have to work on it. But I want to tell you something. I learned that life is too short not to be forgiven. Thirdly, do you see how much God loves you? Oh, as Brother Wayne brought out in the Lord's Supper talk from 1 Corinthians 13 in a powerful way, do you see His love? As Brother Dean read from John 3, 16, what the Father did in the giving of His Son so that we can be saved? And have you come to the Father and let Him kiss you? Have you received the kiss of love? Look in the Roman letter and the fifth chapter. In Romans chapter 5, look what's said in verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see the demonstration of love with Jesus on the cross? God said, I'll show you how much I love you. That's the kiss of love. Secondly. Think about the kiss of forgiveness. Look in Colossians chapter 1. And notice what the Apostle Paul had to say when he wrote to the church at Colossae. In Colossians chapter 1 in verse 14, in whom, talking about Christ, we have redemption through His blood, watch it, the forgiveness of sins. When I am obedient to the gospel of Christ, I am forgiven by God. I come in contact with the blood of Christ. My sins are blotted out. The Father kisses me. I am taken away from that which has separated me from the Father. But have you thought about a third thing? Go back to Romans 5 and look at verse 10. In verse 10, notice he said, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Do you see the kiss of reconciliation? What it means to be back in fellowship with God. 
though I've sinned and though I've strayed and though I'm the one that wandered away, God receives me back when I come home. And there's a reconciliation. There's a relationship brought back into rightness. But then think of the kiss of joy. As we read in Luke 15, 10, when one sinner repents, heaven rejoices. I want to tell you something. If heaven rejoices, we should rejoice. But then think about the kiss of comfort. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, when Paul gave that dissertation about the second coming of Christ, and he said the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who remain will be caught up to meet him. He says in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. He's coming again. And then we receive the kiss of assurance. Look in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, notice if you will, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Look at that. Assurance of faith. That's what I need to know that God has forgiven me. Have you ever thought about God's forgiveness? Isn't it beautiful to think of the Father kissing us, embracing us? and welcome us home. And this morning, if you've never put on Christ, or if you've stumbled and, star and, and strayed, why not come back? Because I'll tell you what, if you've ever received the kiss of God, you get a picture of that young man in Luke 15, embraced by a compassionate Father who loves us. If you need